Hello, and now we're on to the Gospel of John. So if you've been paying attention in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when you get to the Gospel of John, you'll suddenly realize this is a lot different. In fact, in a moment, I'll just show you some of the ways in which uh, the Gospel of John is quite different in its feel and in its presentation uh, than the other synoptic Gospels are. They're called synoptic Gospels because they have this, the same look at Jesus. But John, uh, John's, and now for something completely different, and um, Clement of Alexandria, I believe it was, uh, said that John was more of a spiritual gospel, or I might say John is a more symbolic gospel, uh, that the gospel of John is much more written um, to present who Jesus is uh, than it was uh, to give you a precise historical account of what Jesus did. That is, that is to say, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that John isn't historical, I'm saying that it's, it's much more of the message version of Jesus, is, as it were, uh, than, than, say, the RSV. Well, I think you'll be convinced uh, maybe by the time this, this short video is over, and I'm saying that as a hopefully a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the Gospel of John, some, some background uh, to the Gospel of John. It's usually dated to the 90s. This would make it um, one of the last books of the New Testament to be written, and certainly the last gospel uh, to be written. So almost all of the apostles we, we could imagine uh, were, have passed from the scene by the time the gospel of John has been written. In fact, the way, um, just to be honest, the way that John 21 is written, you know, that the beloved disciple is the one who's given witness to these things, and we know his witness is true. It sounds like the voice in John 21 is talking about the beloved disciple rather than the beloved disciple speaking himself. And so um, uh, I, I wonder if uh, there was a disciple of the beloved disciple who somewhat put the Gospel of John into its final form. Can't prove it, um, but these are the thoughts that come to my mind. The source, therefore, of the Gospel of John is this beloved disciple, which traditionally has been thought to be John the son of Zebedee. However, um, th there's also uh, some reason to believe that John, the son of Zebedee, may have been martyred. Remember when James and John uh, want to sit on Jesus' right and left hand, and Jesus asks them if they're able to drink from the cup uh, that he's going to drink from, and they say, yeah, yeah, you got a cup? We'll be glad to drink from it. You know, and he says, you will. Well, we know that James did. James is beheaded in uh, uh, Acts chapter 12. Uh, and so some would say that this is also indicating the way that John, the son of Zebedee, died. Of course, there are uh, some voices in the early church that suggest there may have been more than one John uh, in those early days. Is it um, uh, um, Demetrius of Alexandria? Is that the one who says that there were two Johns, one of whom probably wrote Revelation and the other of whom wrote the Gospel of John? Again, that may be some guesswork, just like we're doing guesswork uh, here. Uh, but if, let's say that he, uh, is it Dionysius or Demetrius? Dionysius the Areopagite? No, it's uh, Demetrius of Alexandria, I think. Should have double-checked. Uh, but anyway, um, if there were two Johns, then my money would be on John and the son of Zebedee being the author of Revelation, uh, and John the Elder uh, being the author of the Gospel of John. Well, uh, Martin Hengel has a book called The Beloved Disciple, uh, I think it is, um, that um, advances that hypothesis. Well, we don't really know, but but the the Gospel of John is clearly of a of a different style than the Book of Revelation, and we don't know who the beloved disciple is. Um, ben Witherington of Asbury thinks it might be Lazarus, uh, since when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, they say, "Look at how Jesus loved him, beloved." So Lazarus is beloved. Hey, 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 uh, could he be the beloved disciple? We don't really know. I mean, if we're disciplined, you know, the tradition is it's John. Uh, but if we're disciplined, we have to acknowledge that the Gospel of John really doesn't tell us who, who it is. Maybe written at Ephesus, that would fit. Um, again, that's kind of a tradition that John ended his life at Ephesus. We don't know for sure. Um, uh, Gnostics are on the rise, especially a group called Docetists. And the Docetists don't believe that Jesus truly came in the flesh. He only seemed to come in the flesh. So when we read John 1.14, uh, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, or we read the very vivid imagery of unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you know, in John chapter 6, probably not to be read with that accent, um, we can perhaps see 
uh, the way that John has told is told as dialoguing with Docetus, who don't believe Jesus came in the flesh. Uh, John the Baptist. So the way the way the first few chapters of the Gospel of John are told, uh, John the Baptist is downplayed more than he's downplayed in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Could it be that there were some followers of John the Baptist at Ephesus who didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and that the Gospel of John is written especially in a way to make it clear that um, uh, John the Baptist was not the end of, of the line, that he was the forerunner of the true Messiah, which is Jesus. And of course, the book of Acts, uh, especially Acts 19, and of course, um, uh, yes, and Apollos at the end of chapter 18, indicates to us that there were followers of John the Baptist at Ephesus uh, who didn't necessarily believe in Jesus. And so the way that the uh, John the Baptist is portrayed at the, in the first few chapters of John of the Gospel of John may be reflective of that context. Some of this is speculative, of course. Um, and again, I would say that the Gospel of John is highly symbolic. Um, the way it's it's told in a highly symbolic way, that if we are reading John uh, like we're reading a um, um, a videotape, we're probably not reading the Gospel of John uh, quite the way it's meant to. This, by the way, um, is uh, lets us off the hook with uh, harmonization. Um, John is the hard gospel to harmonize with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, and so we, we can let ourselves off the hook and say, well, we don't really have to harmonize the gospel of John with Matthew, Mark, and Luke because it's a very symbolic um, gospel. Well, I don't have all the answers, uh, but let me, let me just talk about uh, an assignment I sometimes have. Uh, if I were physically present teaching, New Testament survey, I might have um, the, a group do this treasure hunt. Can you find these in John? Story of Jesus' birth? Nope, John doesn't do it. A place where God's word takes on flesh? Ding, the incarnation, John 1, 14. A parable like Matthew, Mark, and Luke? No, there are no parables like that. There, there are kind of almost allegorical par parables. The, the, the sheep know my voice, and the thief tries to come in and steal but that's not like the parables of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There once was a shepherd who had some sheep and a thief tried to, you know, it's a different different format. It's, it's unpacked, it's messagized as it were. It's de-parabolized in a way. And so this is interesting since Mark says that Jesus didn't open his mouth without a parable, which is a clue again, that the gospel of John is not giving us a videotape or a transcript. It's more symbolic in its, in its portrayal. A reference to sign, yes signs everywhere in the Gospel of John, which again, when you think of the Gospel of Mark, uh, no signs will be given to this generation, Jesus says in Mark, and only one sign in Matthew and Luke, the sign of Jonah. And so this is not a contradiction, it's just that a, 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 an indicate, uh, it's a sign of how John uses words differently and has a different approach from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. An exorcism, not a single exorcism in John, lots of exorcisms in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus' exorcist ministry was a major part of his mission, but John doesn't tell us about a single exorcism. And again, not, not a contradiction, but you can see John is completely different. John, in my opinion, if you'd have been there on the countryside, it would have looked a lot more like the Gospel of Mark than the Gospel of John. That's not to say the Gospel of John is false. I'm not saying that at all. I'm simply saying that the Gospel of John is a much more um, symbolic and, and um, um, how shall I say it, um, unpacked. John makes everything clear uh, that is not entirely clear. It has to be understood in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's, it's laid bare in the Gospel uh, of John. It's much clearer. That's one of the reasons why they say that when a person first becomes a Christian, give them the Gospel of John, because everything's clear in the Gospel of John. It wasn't clear if you'd have been sitting there on the countryside, possibly. Jesus' temptation by Satan, not mentioned in John, but it is in Matthew and Luke. A command to keep Jesus' identity secret. Nope, none of that in John. Now, it's in Mark, right? The messianic secret is a theme, a, a, a distinctive feature of Mark. But rather, an open proclamation of Jesus' identity? Absolutely. John is very in your face. You know, I am God, you know, with a megaphone in the Gospel of John, because John is making everything clear. Um Jesus' disciples baptizing? Yes, in John, but not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus talking to a woman. Well, I'm alluding here to the woman at the well, a unique story uh, in 
of the Gospel of John, of course, a story that the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament do not have. This might surprise you, but the earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of John don't have the story of the woman caught in adultery. Some people think, oh, that's, that's still true, probably. That probably happened, even though it wasn't in the original copy of John. It's possible. Um, it's possible. We get attached to things because they're part of our tradition, you know, three wise men. You know, and then we read in the text, well, it doesn't actually say three. We get really troubled about those sorts of things uh, because they're part of our history. They're part of our tradition. Um, we like this story of the woman caught in adultery. But really, if it wasn't, if it didn't happen and wasn't in the original manuscript, that wouldn't change our faith at all. It would just mean that there was a story that, that was a legend. Um, so, again, quite possible it happened, but our attachment to it, uh, is a sign of the fact that we are uh, we we become attached to things we grow up with, uh, so to speak. Um, Jesus throwing money change out of the temple happens in the first year of Jesus' ministry uh, in John. Happens in the last week of Jesus' ministry uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Of course, you could say, well, he did it twice. But again, John's very symbolic, and so there may be a symbolic reason why he has it in the first year. By the way, only John indicates that Jesus ministered over three years. We don't. We don't hear that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As far as Matthew, Mark, and Luke are concerned, it could have happened over the space of one year. They don't say it didn't happen in three years. Feeding of the 5,000, yes. This is the only parable that's in, or the only miracle story that's in all four Gospels, if I remember correctly. A statement on the final judgment, not a lot in John. John is not as apocalyptic as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is not as eschat eschatological in that sense uh, as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, a place where Jesus says, I am something? Yes, all over the place in John. This is a major feature of the Gospel of John. Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays in a garden, but it doesn't say it's Gethsemane. Uh, Jesus eating the Passover the me meal. John doesn't actually say that it's the Passover meal. In fact, uh, it's quite possible to read John as uh, Jesus uh, dying at the time of the Passover meal that the meal he eats is the night before the Passover meal, because in the Gospel of John, uh, the high priest doesn't want to go into Pilate's chamber because they want to be able to eat the Passover. And so it might, it could be that symbolically in the Gospel of John, Jesus dies at the very same time that the lambs are being slaughtered for the Passover meal that evening. You'll have to decide what you think about that, whether that's symbolic or whether um, it can be harmonized in some way. A trip to Jerusalem for a feast? Yes, all over the place. Jesus constantly goes to Jerusalem. This is very unique in John. We hear nothing of those things in um, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. A person Jesus raises from the dead? Yes, Lazarus. Of course, uh, Jesus raises uh, um, uh, other people, or a woman, in, um, in the other Gospels. Uh, Jesus washing the feet of the disciples? Yes, this is unique to John. Jesus promising he will send the Holy Spirit. Yes, this is unique to John also uh, in terms of the, the discourse. You have a long discourse where Jesus predicts things about the Holy Spirit. Now, now the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do, talk, do predict that Jesus will uh, send the Holy Spirit. Um, but I don't think Jesus himself predicts it in those Gospels. High priestly prayer, John 17, where Jesus prays for the church that will come, that it will be unified. A point where Peter, Jesus asks Peter if he loves him. Yes. Uh, in the final chapter, John 21, asks him three times, which really hurts Peter or, or grieves Peter that he asked three times because, of course, Peter denies Jesus three times. A purpose statement of the gospel? Yes. Uh, 2021. Um, uh, Jesus did many things that are not contained in this book, uh, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing in him, you might have eternal not life through his name. That's the purpose. The gospel of John is, a, is an evangelistic book. Okay, so to end up, what are the special themes of the Gospel of John? Jesus is the one who came down from heaven. The pre-existence of Jesus is not really that clear in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but it is overwhelmingly clear in the Gospel of John. The Word became flesh. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven. So the pre-existence of Jesus is a major contribution of John uh, to Christian theology. Jesus is the giver, giver of signs. I've mentioned uh, that John... Uh, talks about Jesus doing signs all the time, whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't. Now, it's not that Jesus doesn't do miracles in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's just that they don't call them signs. Signs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are more signs on demand. You know, here Jesus jumped through a hoop. Um, Jesus won't do that. Uh, but he gives plenty of signs in the way that John defines the word. 
Um, since I suspect that Jesus himself uh, was more like uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke in his use of the word. Uh, but again, Jesus did, does miracles in those gospels as well. Uh, the importance of faith in Jesus. This is a John thing. Now, it's not that we can't find hints of this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus largely talks about God the Father and, and uh, believing in the good news of the kingdom of God the Father. Uh, but John has us believing much more on Jesus, uh, John 3.16, of course. Um, whoever believes in him will not perish. So the importance of faith in Jesus is much more a Gospel of John thing um, than a focus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, although, again, it's there. I am sayings. Jesus is repeatedly calling, saying, I am this or I am that. I am the way, the truth, and the life, for example, a key verse there. But Jesus also says, I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the gate for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection. I'm the, and I'm the true vine. And of course, before Abraham was, I am. That, this one here, before Abraham was, I am, Jesus compares himself probably to Yahweh at the burning bush. And, and so much says as I am God. Um, the way that John symbolically, maybe, portrays these I am statements, he connects them with miracles. So I am the bread of life is where he feeds the 5,000. Uh, I am the uh, resurrection is when he raises Lazarus from the dead. I am the good shepherd when he's talking about um, the, the, the leaders of Israel being blind, the blind leading the blind, and so forth. A light from the light of the world, he heals a blind man. And so, again, you could argue that John has symbolically arranged these miracles and paired them with I am sayings to give us a true picture of who Jesus is in a very kind of spirit, a spiritual gospel. Um, and again, I've already mentioned some of the unique features of John, but as I close this video, let me just mention them. The beloved disciple, uniquely to John. The Last Supper, washing of feet, unique in John. The possible death as the lambs are being slaughtered, unique to John. Jesus is the Lamb of God. This is only said in the Gospel of John. Uh, and then the consistent downplaying of John the Baptist significance, uh, unique to John. And so there's, there's a little taste of the uniqueness of the Gospel of of John, which is a profound and very deep uh, presentation of Jesus.